air no you got it <laughs> all right and as everyone comes in i want to welcome you welcome you as you join association chat live 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 and we're going to be talking about how associations can tell their stories and hey larry i see you hey member clicks <laughs> Lots of different folks. Great to see you. And don't forget, as Lara is displaying right now, uh, you can type into the chat box. If this is your first time visiting, then you can type into the chat or you can ask your questions in the Q&A. Either way, we'll be looking over there, monitoring it as time goes by. And Greg is pretty adept at, at multitasking, too. So I, I imagine that even while he's talking <laughs> with us, he'll be able to share some. All right, so I'm gonna give it just a little bit longer. Hey, Jay, nice to see ya. Um, and then I will kick it off. So let's just give everyone a few more seconds. It's that two o'clock Eastern time thing. All right. We're excited to do, we're excited today too. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and get this started. What do you guys say? Are we ready? All right. Welcome to this edition of Association Chat, your weekly online discussion for the association community where we warm ourselves by the virtual fire with the topics of the day, welcoming thought leaders and trailblazers alike to join up in this online home for the community. I am your host, Kiki Latalien, and I'm the CEO of Amplified Growth Digital Marketing and host of this weekly chat that's been around since 2009. Can you believe it? Starting out on Twitter, Blab, and now Huzzah. So a long time ago in a land far, far away, <laughs> or maybe not so far for some of us, uh, associations had a couple of traditional ways to tell their stories. And if you want to time travel to today, you flash forward to today and in the year 2016, now associations have seemingly endless possibilities on how to tell their stories. And so whether you're talking about newsletters or video, having to tell your story in 140 characters or less or on Snapchat, association chat is going to have you covered with all the current trends this afternoon because we're going to talk about storytelling and our guest this week is the illustrious <laughs> greg melia cae he's vice president of program development for itm productions uh itm productions u.s industry news yes correct yeah. okay itm productions is the creative and commercial arm of itn which has made the independent national news in britain since 1955 and they have done all kinds of stuff working in high quality creative content for the corporate broadcast digital and association sector ding 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 <laughs> including live broadcasts of the english football league the international emmy award-winning dispatches escape from isis and industry specific programs produced in conjunction with more than 30 associations around the world. So kind of a big deal. You might already know and love Greg from his previous professional experience, uh, which includes 12 years with ASAE, uh, and that's the American Society of Association Executives. And he also before that was with the US Chamber of Commerce's Institute for Organization Management and the Environmental Protection Agency. Just you know, in case you weren't impressed already. <laughs> Greg is uh, also an avid Scotch aficionado and collector and a lifelong Patriots fan. Uh, I have to say that he is, uh, a, I'm very much a fan of Greg's and I'm so glad that he's here on Association Chat today. Um, there are a million ways I could brag more about who this guy is, but let's go ahead and prove it, right? We want to show, we want to, we, I don't even need to tell this story. You're going to find it out for yourself because we're going to talk a little bit about storytelling and Greg has a lot to say. So welcome so much, Greg. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Kiki. It's an honor to be here. And uh, thanks, <laughs> Keith, for the shout out for the Pats there. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, let's get it kicked off and let's talk a little bit about how storytelling has changed, because I, I talked about that a little bit in the intro. And certainly we've seen it over the years that the way that organizations tell their story 
it's different and it, and it is changing. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, you know, I think it was great when you referenced that uh, long scroll of words at the beginning of uh, Star Wars and the way that we can think <laughs> about how it used to be about the written world word and told from one perspective, uh, you know, and for those of us who've been around the industry long enough, that were, those were mailed newsletters. Uh, then we uh, <laughs> eventually got to saying, oh, we'll just do the same newsletters uh, that are written by staff or written by contributed authors uh, from members, but we'll send them out once a month. Nowadays, it's much more complex than that. People want news that and stories that are quick. Uh, they want stories that come in a variety of different uh, authentic voices. Uh, they want stories that are made personal to them. And probably more than ever before, they're looking for those stories to emotionally connect with them. Not mm -hmm. just not just give them the, the data or read like a newspaper. What they want is, is, is those stories to feel like the saga of Star Wars. They, mm -hmm. they want to relate to the characters and they want to be engaged and, and brought in uh, to the storytelling aspect. Well, you know, how does that connect with who is telling the story? Because um, as we have no, I mean, we've seen the formats and stuff of, of the, the channels change in the way that people choose to tell their stories. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but the voices have changed. And I think that I think that the associations wanting to figure out the best way to communicate their story need to be thinking about who it is that's telling it. Can you speak to that? Yeah, it, you know, it used to be that uh, the association life and the association story was narrated. And it was narrated by basically one of three people. It was narrated by the staff executive, by the uh, chief elected uh, leader uh, or by the media relations or the uh, editor. Uh, and those were the three voices and those three voices worked hard to keep everything sounding exactly the same. And it sounded as if associations were sort of one person, one body, one story to tell. And that's just not who we are. I mean, every single association brings together people who have a common passion, but are approaching it from different angles. And so what we see now is more of an orchestra, uh, more of the opportunity to tell this, that common story by highlighting the innovation that's being done uh, by different companies, by having staff at all level of the organization contribute, and by having members, not necessarily the chief elected volunteer, but members at every stage come forward and contribute their voice, whether that's uh, on Capitol Hill or that's in the media or that's on a blog post. What we're seeing is, is that it's turned into a dialogue mm. uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and a rich tapestry of voices, whether that's on Twitter or it's just looking at my associations now. And my favorite part of associations now every month is when they interview different members on the same yeah. topic. Oh, you know. I love that. And I love it in all in all of the different ways that they do it, whether whether it is asking them the same question. It's usually like asking them the same question or how they would deal with a problem. But then even when even when it shows several pages and it's like, you know, they're featuring someone It's like, what what's your favorite, you know, magazine? What's your favorite? I love that stuff. It's brilliant. Yeah. People relate to people. And people relate to stories and experiences. Right. And so if we want to show how our associations are making a difference, what we want to do is, is we want to get in there and we want to highlight the, the impact that we've had on, in, on a specific individual. Mm -hmm. So don't mm -hmm. talk about a program that you have and don't spend your time talking about the program. Instead, talk about the person's experience with that program. You know, and a great example of this, the American Waterworks Association in Denver actually hired a, a former journalist to come in. And this journalist is tasked with telling what its members value, not mm -hmm. what the association wants to tell, but what its members value. So when they look at it, they take a journalistic approach uh, rather than a marketing approach. Mm -hmm. Find the characters, find the angle that will interest people and tell the story through the lens of individual experiences. 
So you're giving a lot of people who have uh, journalism, especially in, <laughs> who've looked at focusing on the written word, for instance, a lot of hope out there because many people have worried about, you know, with the, the fall of newspapers and all of that kind of stuff, where do they go? Where do they go next? And so are you, are you saying that, you know, maybe taking a journalistic approach, these associations that are beginning to look at that, that, um, that that's a trend that you're seeing and, you know, what does that, what does that mean for the communications field? Yeah, I think that there's two elements. Okay. that play in uh, on this. One is creating a space where your members can bring forward their stories. And the great part about that, and I, I think we saw this on CNN a few years ago, they started doing iReport and allowing everyone to upload their footage and their perspective of, of what they saw happening in an event. And that's sort of like what we see in the Twitter feeds at conferences. That's really great because it's quick and it's authentic uh, and it's the voice and perspectives of individuals but it very quickly gets very crowded and mm -hmm. very difficult to uh, monitor uh, along the way. It's not a bad thing, but what we really need then is, is to say, how do we have a conductor that brings those themes back together and weaves them into a narrative? You know, So if you're using um, uh, Twitter at a uh, conference, how do you go back afterwards and have somebody create a storefy where yes. they can weave yes. through the, the different pieces and say, here are different angles th that people uh, could see. The uh, second side on the journalistic approach, I think, is really charging somebody to go and listen to members and amplify their stories. Mm -hmm. You know, so I love hearing your, your company's name every time, Amplified Growth. I know, me too. We're, we're gonna go into business <laughs> together and, and launch Amplified Stories. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, because, I'm gonna do that right now. I'm gonna. I'm like amplifystory.com. Okay, oh man, no. but, <laughs> um, man, somebody's probably registering it as sure. we. Sure, uh, I we know. Chat. <laughs> Karen, Karen Hansen, I see her over there. You go. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know that idea of bringing the different pieces together, collecting the different uh, perspectives, and then and then bringing them forward because. A challenge that associations have, and that I think each of us has, is is that we don't we aren't always the best person to tell our own story. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. I was talking with somebody, and they were talking about how other people saw them as successful, mm -hmm. and they were like, well, "I don't know why they see it that way." Well, a third party can get in there and ask some probing questions, and can draw together uh, the similarities and differences uh, with others. Um, but I think most importantly is whose stories are we featuring? Mm -hmm. You know, and when you allow it just to happen in the traditional challenges, associations feel bound by governance. They feel bound by titles. They feel bound by positions. Right. Journalists, if you ever think about it, when you watch the national news, they don't go out and try to find the person in charge of the homeowners association to talk about a fire that happened. They don't go out to talk to just the principal to figure out the impact on students when they're talking about a school. What they look for are the unique characters that have been impacted by a story, and then they get their quick gut reactions so that we can tell stories in an authentic voice quickly. Right. And I, I, I can't agree with you more. I mean, I so I studied journalism in college and my first job right out of college was uh, working the front desk for uh, the Joplin Globe for anyone who's interested and just a fantastic newspaper. And uh, anyway, it, it was a really interesting thing to sort of watch as my dream of focusing in on the newspaper space kind of took me in different areas with with social media coming around and there are so many different channels and i guess you know because the communications field has so dramatically changed because of technology and and the addition of new channels and new uh, a new uh, expectation on on when and how soon you're going to get information i think that a lot of people are they're overwhelmed by the noise, yes, but they're also overwhelmed by the options. They're they're overwhelmed by what they know has worked in the past, 
and what all of these newfangled opportunities are that are presented to them. And so I guess, you know, I'm curious to hear what you think about, you know, how associations might best navigate that, um, you know, someone who's stepping into the role of, you know, chief marketing officer, or looking at communications director, and, they, and they're asking themselves, gosh, you know, we, yeah, we still do a newsletter, but out of all of the different channels, where do I go next? What do we have and what, what do we do? Yeah, do we do? you know, and, and I certainly think that part of that responsibility uh, rests back with the chief marketing officer and the C-suite, but I think there's a role for every single person at an association to mm -hmm. start thinking about their role in the communication cacophony. <laughs> um, you know, thinking about how they improve their communication so that it is more easily received and more easily navigated. So I think that there's there's really two different directions that I would go there. You know, the first is really sort of the analytical uh, question. Do I need to say this at all? And, and if so, am I saying it to the right people? You know, so a, a, a portion of, an, of a responsibility of being part of an association communication team is to realize that you need to think about communication through your members' ears, not through your mouth. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, figure out how do we get uh, folks the information that they need, that they want, and um, have it targeted uh, in ways that make sense for them. Uh, so that's one side of it. Let's not oversaturate our members. Uh, I've always given the guidance before you send a mass email to somebody, imagine yourself writing the first sentence in, you are receiving this email because, and if you can't write a justification on why they're getting that email, other than the fact that you have their email or they're a member, <laughs> it's probably not targeted enough. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Go back and, and work on a little bit. The second side is, there are some tricks that can help you make the messages that you're crafting much easier for people to receive and to stick with them. And, and that really uh, relies in the uh, images and moving image. When people see a, a infographic that puts together a picture with data and words, or when they see a short, uh, video clip that helps them uh, navigate, they're instantly engaged, not just in thinking about the content, but also the emotions that those pictures bring up to them uh, right. and the depth of the rest of the element. You know, So for example, if you put up a, a picture saying that we're having a uh, cocktail reception and you put a picture with black tie and uh, martinis, that sends a very different message than saying, we're having a cocktail reception, you put up red solo cups and a tailgate. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. So, you know, the, the two communications would take about the same amount of time to process, but the ability for somebody to get in there and, and have it stick with them. And the other thing is, is everyone's going to go away from this chat thinking about those red solo cups <laughs> because it's such yeah, a right. such a vid visual uh, image. Same thing happens uh, along the way. I learned something cool. Um, I had a uh, chance uh, over the weekend to be with one of the executive coaches from Twitter, uh, oh, wow. and I learned something new about about Twitter that that I hadn't realized. You can actually attach up to four pictures on every tweet. Yeah. And with each picture that you attach, your engagement increases an average of 2%. That I did not know. That's yeah. interesting. So That's interesting. You know, for everybody out there who's uh, sort of hanging around on that, once you've put that first picture, just hit the picture button again, and <laughs> you can go ahead and add uh, the additional three pictures. Wow. How interesting. You know, I never knew the, I knew, never knew the, uh, the metrics for adding the additional images, but that is interesting. 
So I just want to note over here on the side as we've been talking that uh, Karen Hans was saying, go journalists, because I mean, she actually does come from RT DNA. So has a little bit of a, a connection there. And then we had some interesting conversation talking about uh, the written word and talking about um, beer pong. So <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of the benefit of, of being part of this live is that you are able to ask the questions and connect with the people here. So I want to encourage everyone who is watching live to please go ahead and, and ask the questions that you want to ask um, and share. Also, I want to remind you to share with people that are out there on Twitter and out there online and out there on Facebook so that they know that, that you're having a good time here. And I hope that you are. But with all of that, let's talk a little bit about video because video is, you know, clearly something that, that I enjoy quite a bit as far as, you know, my preferred content. Uh, but I don't know. It's not preferred. It's just for certain things. Um, what's needed for an effective video strategy? Yeah, it, you know, I think that uh, video covers a, a huge range uh, of pieces. Uh, so we'll have a lot to, to chat about, yeah. you know, on this. But I think the first part there is that question of video strategy. You know, as I've been talking with a lot of different associations, what I keep hearing back is people saying, well, I don't need a video strategy. Video is one part of my communications strategy. Mm -hmm. I think that is probably one of the most short-sighted and uh, potentially detrimental things uh, that somebody can say right now. Video, uh, just you know, take for a moment what we're seeing in the news headlines today, you know, AT&T and Time Warner trying oh, to come yeah. together, mainly because yeah. They want to be able to bring more video content directly to people wherever they are 24 seven, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and what's happening is, is people are realizing is that video is a tool just like mobile technology is a tool. I think that the uptake is actually a lot larger. You know, the estimates are that uh, 80 to 90% of internet traffic is all going to be video that mm -hmm. comes through. Uh, and so, uh, thinking about how you get onto that train, I think is tremendously important. So, um, I got some people, <laughs> got some people doing my leaves. <laughs> that's lovely. Don't you love it when they do that exactly when you don't want them to? That's, that's exactly where we are. Okay. So what do we need in order to really have, uh, an effective, uh, video strategy? Um, you know, first we have to decide why we're doing video. You know, who are we trying to communicate with and what's the purpose uh, of it? Uh, you know, in some cases, we're going to be trying to influence members of uh, Congress or politicians or the broader general public. That has to look fabulously great, you know, right. because right. you're in huge competition for, for who you're competing with. In other cases, you're trying to create an authentic opportunity for people to come together in something like this. And it's probably more important that this happens live and that we have the chat than we're worried about whether, uh, you know, somebody's outside doing the leaves right. <laughs> you, you, right. you know, or not. Yeah. Um, you know, so you've got sort of that range. But the first thing is, who are we making this video for and what's its purpose? Uh, the second that I think we need to figure out is how are we going to, who are we going to feature and what's the story that's going to bring and be persuasive to those people that are, are watching? You know, so if we're talking about uh, trying to influence uh, funders or um, people, politicians, we probably want to be showing their constituents back in their neighborhood and showing how we're making a, a difference uh, in that. Uh, if uh, what we're trying to do is to show people and create that emotion that they're missing what's happening at an event, we probably want to pick out the highlights of that event and bring them forward in a way that really tugs onto the emotional side of those areas. If we're doing something that is for an educational purpose, we want to make sure that it hits those learning objectives mm -hmm. and has the right content. Uh, so we've got all of that. And then the last piece that we probably have to think about is how are we going to deliver it? And we've got tremendous new uh, opportunities 
to deliver video, uh, whether it's through uh, the internet, uh, whether it's uh, through social media channels, whether it's featuring at a uh, conference, uh, or sending it. We saw these great brochures when I was over in London. You open up the brochure, and it's got a built-in little screen with it. So now all of a sudden, uh, somebody can uh, see a customized video uh, for them uh, in their needs. Yeah. Uh, delivered right into their into their mailbox. I mean, it's it's phenomenal, and I I think that that being able to communicate that way it does present you with so many options that's dizzying, but it's also I think it's enabling for us to to be able to spread the word and do the great things that we're we're all trying to do with our organizations. And, you know, I mean, and, and just getting our minds around that. I mean, yes, yes, you know, we're, there's so much noise, there's so much out there. But when you really get it and you do the work and you don't try to spread yourself in and you don't shortchange the project, but you think, yeah, who am I trying to connect with? What is it that we're trying to, what, what would be the best way to communicate this thing to them to motivate them to do x i i think it's a it's amazing it's like magic the things that we're able to do it it, it really is and um you know uh, let me give you uh an example so the last three years we've partnered with a pensions savings association in the uk to mm -hmm. make videos to help people think about planning, uh, better planning the retirement uh, funding. You know, better planning the retirement funding does not sound like a particularly engaging video to watch. No, no, <laughs> so, you know, definitely what you, not sexy, not, <laughs> not a sexy thing. So uh, what you need in that case is somebody who understands how to take a dry concept and bring it to life. And so a couple of the things that we've done uh, on the pension uh, side of things, uh, we went to a zoo in London and we talked about the difference between fast animals and slow animals and that idea of a race uh, and being able to talk about uh, planning out your investment strategy. How um, fun. How so that was for like building. Yeah. Um, and then this year we went to a middle school and filmed middle school kids doing science experiments where they were letting air out of balloons and you could see the spending side of pensions you know and thinking about that planning ahead are you going to use all of your money at once what's are the different factors that that you need so all of a oh sudden my gosh that is brilliant that, yeah i can we've just got to, see that and i can just like if you capture just a little sound bite or something of some adorable kid that's like, where did it all go? Or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally, I mean, it's totally, it's totally, that's totally exactly how it is. Is this, yeah. you know, people love seeing animals. They love seeing uh, kids. They kids, love seeing yeah. um, the unexpected. Um, we uh, did a film for a uh, British Hospitality Association. We we're talking about uh, going to amusement parks. So we strapped the reporter into an amusement park ride and he gave the report as the ride uh, ran, you know, not standing in front of the ride, but strapped into the ride. <laughs> you awesome. know? And you're like, that's, that's the difference. Uh, and that was one of the reasons, you know, for me, why I was so excited about uh, ITN productions and what it brings, you know, to our space, because frankly, we've never had, any of the major networks here in the US say, we want to tell the story of what associations are doing and we want to help associations in uh, supporting their communications and mission needs. Um, so it's sort of a great thing and I, and I love London. So. Well, yeah, I know. I, and you just got back from there, right? Yeah, I was yeah. Ju just I guess across that's a regular again. thing now. You're always going to be able to say yes to that question, right? You know, uh, I, I, uh, I, I'm excited. I'll, I'll probably make it over four times a year. Uh, and that's, you know, four times more than I've been able to make it recently. So I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, let's talk a little bit more about the different types of channels. I want to I talk about where you come up with 
with ideas and, you know, and then we can move into talking a little bit more about some of what you're doing with ITN. I do want to go in that direction. But but let's talk a little bit about about coming up with good ideas, because I know a lot of people feel like beleaguered with with how they're supposed to be creative when they're looking at all these different channels. So what makes sense when you're looking at a channel like Facebook? What makes sense when you're looking at a channel like Twitter? Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's play. Let's play a little let's channel play. channel roulette. Yes. <laughs> you know? So let's. Facebook, you know, Facebook, I think, is a place where people blend their personal and their professional lives. Uh, and I think it's a tremendous place to be able to celebrate anniversaries, to be able to celebrate accomplishments, to be able to uh, show pictures. I mean, I had a lot of pride today looking and seeing pictures from Scott Wiley as he oh, yeah, spoke yeah. at the Dubai uh, Chamber uh, uh, on behalf of ASAE. That makes me feel like I'm behind the scenes, sort of where they are, uh, and that's a real, a real positive. Facebook, more than any other platform, is all in on video. Mm -hmm. And they are uh, changing their... Um, both their promotion structure and their algorithm to make videos seen more often and move into autoplay. It's the number one way that if anyone is looking to get, uh, well, number one way to get engagement, paid or organic. But if you're just looking at organic, you really need to look at your video content because it's the number one way that you're going to be able to increase the amount of organic viewers that you're going to have. So uh, a little story to tell uh, on that one. And uh, I was able to catch up with the guys who uh, led this uh, when I was in London last week. Uh, one of the uh, networks that we support in the UK is Channel 4. Uh, and Channel 4 is sort of the intellectual side of um, news in the UK. It is funded by the government, sort of like uh, BBC is, to try to reach new audiences, younger audiences, and cover fringe issues. And uh, so Channel 4, if you looked at them in January of last year, was getting about just under 2 million uh, Facebook views uh, per month. And they were doing that by posting text articles, pay, posting pictures with text, and then po po posting posting. <laughs> Poach them too. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> they were definitely not poaching, but they were posting, uh, or maybe they were because what they were mostly posting were actual clips from the news show. So uh, maybe, well, maybe that is poaching. Kind of a little maybe bit that is both. poaching. Yeah. Um, no. And uh, the uh, shift and change uh, is, is that they decided that they were going to go 100% video. Mm -hmm. So their Facebook feed now, 100% video. 100% captioned because they realized that 70% right. of their viewers listen uh, or watch the uh, Facebook videos without sound. P.S. Uh, for ev everyone that's listening, whenever you do that, not only does it increase the, uh, the effect and the engagement that you get for all of your video content, but it also helps you with SEO and it helps you to reach a larger audience because of those people who face disabilities. So just putting that out there, there are many, many reasons to do it. So you just should. Anyway, go ahead. So uh, here is the magic sauce that uh, I really found interesting. A lot of the things you can find out there uh, recommended by others, keep the clip under two minutes, do the captioning, uh, try to make sure that it's square, put animals and kids when you can. But here's <laughs> the magic sauce that I thought was interesting. The team that does the video Facebook uh, updates for Channel 4 creates all of the captions based on their own perspective of what they're seeing in the clip. Hmm. So in other words, they're not trying to translate the news story and shorten the words down uh, and right. still capture that word story. What they're actually are doing is, is these are folks that are talented in digital marketing yeah. instead of just yeah. news journalism. And so when they're putting those texts and they're thinking about that, they're thinking about the SEO, they're doing all those things that you know, are so natural to you, but probably yeah. not the first thing that associations think about. Right. Um, but uh, just great. an amazing way for them. They, and so the kicker of the story, uh, now they're getting over uh, uh, 200 million Facebook views per month. 
Uh, and they've actually changed their channel so that they you can now just subscribe to Royal News and some other <laughs> piece of sport and, and a third uh, because they have that much communication going on. That's amazing. Yeah, I, love that, cool? I mean, I love that. Okay, so you've probably heard all about uh, Twitter. And is it going to be bought out by Facebook? What's the story with all of that? So, of course, Twitter is another one first with looking at uh acquiring periscope but then in making it so that once again we see that anyone who goes live using periscope that 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 is something that more and more people see first if they go to twitter so again a focus on the video content you want to talk a little bit about let's let's spit yeah. spitball some ideas on, 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 what on, you on twitter yeah. yeah um you know uh so I had an interesting experience, experiment uh, that I didn't even know I was running. Uh, you know, <laughs> well, those are the best, aren't they? <laughs> they are the best. Um, I was uh, at uh, Smithsonian Jazz Master Works Orchestra uh, a few weeks ago. And first I was using Facebook Live to uh, broadcast videos. And then I decided, and I'm not even sure quite why I decided, um, that I was going to switch over and use Periscope and send it out over, over Twitter. And what I found was that Facebook Live is a really good way to record video and have your own network see it, mm -hmm. mostly later, not right. as often right, live, right. mostly later. Yeah. Whereas Periscope is a much broader platform. You know, Twitter allows people who are following a hashtag or are uh, more broadly connected to you or are following Periscope and seeing what's live. Mm -hmm. it, it really allows uh, things. So we ended up having um, probably about eight times as many viewers on Periscope. So like 16 versus two. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, uh, in, in any case, it, it that's sort of a piece there. And I think that that's true for Twitter all around, which is uh, tweets can be much more easily found by a broader audience. Yeah. So it's a great way to raise visibility outside of your network. It's a great way to uh, have interaction at conferences where people might share a common hashtag, but they may not yet be part of one another's uh, networks. But the downside uh, on Twitter is the engagement isn't as deep or as lasting. Right. So right. the number of tweets that go out that say, this is a good read mm -hmm. and have a link that never get clicked on uh, is something we all should learn. Is say something before you share something uh, and, and make that meaningful. Uh, and then the, the second is, is to realize that once you've tweeted, if it's important enough, tweet again, you know, or form a part of conversation or write a story by, or use Twitter to find the articles and the case studies that you're going to feature in your next magazine article or your next video program. You know, you know, you're absolutely right. And I think that, um, you know, so, so I love Twitter, but I also, I can see just like, you, it, it's just, you catch people in that moment and you can catch people who you normally, it goes outside of your usual audience, who you normally don't catch. So you can connect to new people that way, but it moves so quickly that if you're trying to share something or you're trying to connect with a particular audience, that um, it, you better do it a couple of times or a few times because you're gonna have to you're gonna have to jump back in and see when you can bring more people. In. Um, if that exposure is something that you want or that engagement is something that you want, but you know what about YouTube? What about so YouTube? Huge and it's something that. Uh, you know, I think a lot of organizations use YouTube as a repository for captured moments in the past at conferences or maybe promotional videos and not so much as a channel for engagement or um, something that is regularly updated where they really have some kind of overall strategy for using it, where it's used like a channel, where it is used like a channel. Yeah, I think that that's, uh, you know, a great observation. And, and that's why we can't be thinking about our videos uh, as just a part of a larger communication strategy. You need to be thinking, okay, well, what are we producing? Who do we want to see it? And how do we make that 
you know, happen. You know, YouTube was absolutely the first platform that allowed people to broadcast themselves, broadcast, you know, their, or, their organization. And it still remains a fabulous platform uh, to be able to have that repository. But if you're not thinking about how you are attracting the right people to those videos, you're missing a huge opportunity. And if you're not thinking about what happens after the people come to the video, you're missing another, you know, opportunity. So uh, I think that associations should look a little bit more at the idea of um, promoted ads and promoted placement with uh, YouTube. So if you know that there is an event a positive event, not a negative event, <laughs> but a positive <laughs> event uh, that is, uh, you know, coming up uh, that is going to uh, be an opportunity for you to spread your message. I, I think that that's a neat place. You know, I'm sort of mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, uh, rocket launches and sporting events and maybe even the presidential you know, uh, elections, uh, although I did say positive event. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. That would be a stretch. <laughs> might be a stretch. Depends, <laughs> depends along the way. Uh, you know, it's an opportunity to go ahead and say, well, we have this piece of video content that has worked really well for us. Let's use this and leverage this now uh, by, you know, paying for keywords uh, and right, having it right, show, right, right. show up as a recommended video that people may want to see. And the flip side's true too, is is that when you are deep into the uh, Twitter, I'm sorry, the YouTube setup, you can actually go in and say, yes, keep me uh, disconnected from videos that have graphic images or that are um, tagged uh, because they are not happy moments. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's equally important because if you're scrolling YouTube video to your association's uh, website and it's feeding them um, stories that are not in line with your brand, you've accomplished one goal and and, and taken a step back. Right. You know, I don't I don't like to focus on on more fear mongering or like more negative stuff. But I did talk with uh, someone who uh, was a guest on the show who said that that basically having having bad video uh, available on different channels is worse than having no video. Uh, what, are, you, what are your thoughts? You know, I, I think that the funny thing about YouTube is it makes it so easy to upload video that people tend to leave stuff there. And, you know, there was one association uh, that I knew that had uploaded a video of their executive uh, wishing people a happy new year and talking about the challenging year ahead. Um, and that challenging year was during the economic downturn about six years ago. Um, and it stayed up. Uh, it's probably actually still up on YouTube. It's not on their website anymore, mm -hmm. but that's a challenge because now all of a sudden your message doesn't hit the relevant because it's out of date. When people have bad sound quality, when they have bad lighting, they have bad uh, production values, people take that as a reflection that the association doesn't care. Yeah. Well, you I know? think it depends on I, I think it depends on uh, what the message like what the purpose is, because I think, for instance, like let's let's just call this what it is. I am in my home office <laughs> and and, you know, and I think that there's there's a time and a place for different types of communication. So like this being on, you know, I, I don't feel bad about it. Well, I don't I don't think. But <laughs> I, I, you know, we'll, we'll have to reevaluate after I watched it again. But um, <laughs> I don't. I don't think that we have the lighting and sound issues, other than my Leaf guys that came by, that yeah. uh, w w that we see oh, oftentimes. Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, for example, if you set a camera at the back of the room for an educational session, and you're recording that session over the camera's mic. Uh, yeah. You know, what you're usually sending is a uh, experience that has a lot of white noise. Um, yeah. You know, can I just can I just chime in here and say I completely agree. Um, anyone who's spending the money to capture 
the the sessions or anything like that you know invest in having at least like one other camera there or something don't just get the backs of heads make sure the sound is good because no no one's going to sit through and watch the backs of heads for you know an hour yeah an hour. no Not you know happen. and so what we did uh recently the for the american society of travel agents is they had a panel and the panel was different ceos from the different cruise lines mm -hmm. and we recorded some b-roll during that session so that you could see that there were a lot of people and uh that uh what the session looked like but for the content we interviewed each of the ceos separately and that way uh doing those interviews and then going back and being able to remix them afterwards they were sort of prompted questions from a professional reporter we were able to remix and create a three-minute piece that not only captured the 60-minute uh, session, but also brought to the table some new uh, elements and some new pieces that uh, hadn't been there before. So thinking a lot about how you are creating a short, you know, maximum four minute clip mm -hmm. that can help people uh, get a concept is really important if, if you want to be effective. Uh, and it, it may be that it's still a little bit optional today. But five years from now, we're going to be looking at this just the same as we're looking at the importance of moving to responsive design and websites right. uh, and moving to personalization and email and realize that we're on the front steps of a technological boom in video that uh, isn't going to uh, treat organizations well if they don't adapt. OK, let's talk about that. Let's go deeper there because um you know before we run out of time i love jumping into the future i love looking at okay so we've talked about where things have been where things are now let's talk about where things are going let's talk about how people can start thinking about the ways they can, might be able to adapt their strategies or their plans so that they can do better moving into the future what are you seeing as far as trends in video and the 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 ways that people are communicating that they, you know, it may behoove people to be aware of as they're looking at moving into doing more with video in the future? Yeah, you know, I think the first question that I would have organizations start to think about is what percentage of their members are coming to their legislative day or their educational events mm -hmm. and uh, begin to think about what might happen if they had a way to capture and engage people in those activities. And I think video is a huge way uh, of doing that. The problem is, is that too often that's done in a way where either the video is quick, but not good, or mm -hmm. it's not quick and it's good. And by the time it's available, it's only a promo reel for the next year. Right. So we need to find ways to, to branch both of those. And, you know, I think that that really relies in, in partnership. You know, I think that whether you're talking about uh, keeping your website up and running, uh, helping your board think about strategy, uh, or in some cases, even thinking about how you're uh, putting human resources against your organization, associations no longer can afford to do everything in-house mm -hmm. you know they need to be thinking about how do i choose the right partner to help me on the right project at the right yeah. at the right time you know and i i think that more and more of them are realizing that like i i do see that but it's strange because so many organizations are still trying to figure out how to keep it all in-house and it's like there are so many different you you need to be experts in different areas and you know, especially for our small ta small staff associations, there are only so many, many people, right? And I understand being multidisciplinary, big fan of it. I think it's great to know a lot about several different areas, but come on. I mean, how far can you, st you need to be, you need to know all about camera work, editing, light, like, and, and, really? Yeah, <laughs> you know? and, and then have the equipment to do that yeah. uh, and yeah. uh, increasingly having access to B-roll, you know, because um, 
The reason you get bored with the session, watching the back of the heads in the front is, is because we want to see things visually change. You know, mm -hmm. we want to yeah. stay engaged, um, particularly when it's not live. When it's live, you still get a little bit of, well, what's going to happen next? Karen mentioned an interesting uh, point there, uh, which is, is that when you're thinking about video, you need to have somebody who understands that you have to put your best uh, picture up top. You know, it's sort of like uh, that back to that journalistic side. Uh, and oftentimes you want to have the editing capabilities to be able to, you know, have that brief intro that says, you know, hey, in today's uh, video uh, clip, we're going to take you on site uh, at, in Reno Tahoe. We're going to uh, bring you up to Capitol Hill and we're going to look at what uh, one company is doing to make a difference in the world. Those are the types of uh, things that can capture a viewer's attention uh, right up front and make them want to stay and watch uh, so that they can be part of the story. When it's just the, I want you to watch my video because I've posted it kind of thing, it's a tough place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that, um, you know, that's one thing that I see people making a mistake on video with all the time is that, you know, maybe they go ahead and take the jump and they make an investment and they, instead of sort of partnering up and thinking strategically about how they're going to use this and who it is and how they're going to emotionally connect or how they're going to be motivated. They think about how their board is going to respond to it. They think about, and they, they try to cram like the annual report or brochure in, in video form. Right. And that is not, you're not, you know, somebody's not going to sit back and be like, gee, you know, they, like, look at their earnings this past year. Like, what, what is that? You know, it doesn't make sense. So there's a real disconnect, I think, in how, how people use the investment in video. And they, they leave the rest of it, the interviews to, like, the, the stuff you can capture on the iPhone or something, you know, yeah, which you is know. fine. It's fine for a little bit, but it's like there's a time and a place, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it is. I was watching a video the other day that was talking about a new product or service that was launched. And if you really broke it down, what they had in that video were two interviews that were of mediocre quality in terms of the sound and light. And then they had that interspliced with just shots and, and titles that were coming in uh, off of a computer. That's not exciting. That's not engaging. That's not yeah. showing how somebody uh, used that product or service in front of a uh, board uh, or use that to unlock uh, and take their association to a whole nother level. So we've got to think about that. How do we capture the stories? How do we tell those stories? And how do we then make sure that those stories capture the hearts of our members? Mm. Mm. I like that. Okay. All right, guys. So, so what do you think? Uh, what do you think about next steps, everyone? I'm, I'm asking the people who are live, anyone who's listening to this later, you're missing out. Uh, <laughs> but for the people who are listening live, who are watching live, what are your thoughts? What are some things that have worked for you? What are some things that are confusing to you? What's the most embarrassing question that you're thinking right now about asking and you're afraid to ask? <laughs> No, don't ask it. But but you know, what's something that you're you're really concerned about when it comes to looking at storytelling and the way that we're telling our stories through things like video? And uh, Karen says over here that she remembers a past guest here saying that video is for emotion, text is for info. It stuck with her. And that's so true. I mean, I, I know that um, people do respond to text. I, I, you know, I still prefer to read, you know, I was talking about this, the Stokes, the Daily Stokes. I still prefer to read a lot um, using hardback books. I like that. But, um, you know, I also, I listen to a ton of podcasts. I watch a ton of videos, but my daughter, like, it's like probably 90% of the information she consumes is, is in video format. And it's not TV either. It's YouTube, well, stuff like that. I, you know, and I think I would, you know, build on that. I think traditionally that has been there because video is much better at emotion than text uh, mm -hmm. on, on a day-to-day -day basis. But this idea that video is not for information, 
uh, isn't at all in line with where the future is going. Right. You know, uh, uh, many of you know that when I was at ASAE, I worked on the personalized uh, membership card uh, that uh, was digitally printed. Uh, today, it, you know, uh, different organizations, uh, I know AT&T does it. I know that we do it in the UK from Barclays Bank. They're creating personalized videos mm -hmm. so that people can get information on uh, everything from how to protect themselves from uh, identity fraud to uh, using products and services. Uh, and that's not so much of an emotional side as much as it that people remember and retain better when they see at the same time they hear, and even better if we caption it and they can read uh, along with it too. Yeah, yeah. So interesting. Well, you know, I have to say uh, it's 2.55 Eastern time, and my, my, how time does fly. Um, this has been absolutely enjoyable, informative, fascinating to me. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this week's association chat. I especially want to thank our special guest, uh, Greg Melia, for lending us his time and expertise. Some upcoming events and association chats that you need to be aware of. On the first, we're talking about demystifying innovation at your association with Amanda Kaiser. And she's gonna be talking about some of the research that she's been working on, some fascinating stuff there. Uh, we're going to talk on the on the eighth, you guys, on the eighth, which I think in America we all know what that means. <laughs> we're facing election day, so uh, November eighth, uh, we're talking about leading your association through a rebrand. I don't know that we realized that that was election day when that topic was chosen for that day, but fascinating that it lands on the eighth. I hope that you've enjoyed this chat and learned something that will help you and your association today. And if you're loving association chat, tell me. No, if you're loving association chat, please consider sharing this chat with your colleagues and give us some love on social media. And as always, if you wanna continue the discussion, you can join the association chat Facebook group for regular updates on upcoming topics and special guests. Thank you for joining in on this great discussion and we will see you next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Kiki. Thank you so much. Thanks, Karen.